All right, we're gonna get started. I know people are coming in, but this is a great panel. I don't wanna cut anyone off uh, sooner than I have to. Okay, this panel is the dignity of the sexed body, asymmetry, equality, and real reproductive justice. We have three fabulous panelists. Um, we'll begin with Erica Bakiaki, who's closest to me. She's a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center and a legal scholar specializing in equal protection jurisprudence, feminist legal theory, Catholic social teaching, and sexual ethics. A 2018 visiting scholar at Harvard Law School. She is also a senior fellow at the Abigail Adams Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she founded and directs the Wollstone Project, the Wollstone Craft Project. Bakiaki's essays have appeared in publications such as the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy, Christian Bioethics through, Harvard, uh, through Oxford University, The Atlantic, First Things, CNN, National Review Online, National Affairs, Claremont Review of Books, SCOTUS Blog, and more. Her newest book, the Rights of Women, Reclaiming a Lost Vision, was published as part of the DeNicola Center's Catholic Ideas for a Secular World series from Notre Dame University Press in 2021, and I might add, is available for purchase in room 204 of the Conference Center. Yes. Abigail Favalli is our next speaker, and she is Dean of the College of Humanities and a professor of English at George Fox University where she completed her undergraduate degree. She received her doctorate at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, where she was a recipient of the Competitive Overseas Research Award in 2011. Um, in 2011, her, I, I apologize, in 2011, her dissertation was granted the Samuel Rutherford Prize for Most Distinguished Thesis in English Literature. Favali is an active writer in multiple genres. Her literary criticism has appeared in various academic journals and essay collections. And in 2017, she was awarded the J.F. Powers Prize for Short Fiction. Favali's memoir about her conversion to Catholicism, Into the Deep, was published in 2018. And her new book, The Genesis of Gender, will be published in early 2022. Our final speaker, Leah Libresco Sargent, um, is a freelance writer whose work ranges across multiple disciplines from religion to statistics to theater. <laughs> Her writing first appeared in, has appeared in First Things, America, The American Conservative, The American Interest, Commonweal, and many others. She is the author of Arriving at Amen, Seven Catholic Prayers That Even I Can Offer, and Building the Benedict Option. She was previously a public policy researcher and a news writer for 538. She is the founder, most recently, of Other Feminisms, a Substack newsletter interested in creating within modern feminism a culture that values interdependence over autonomy. With that, let us welcome our speakers and get them started with Erica. Thank you, it's so wonderful to be here. I've enjoyed myself thoroughly. Um, so for the last half century, constitutionally protected access to both contraception and abortion have given men and women a kind of right to non-procreative sex and with it, the putative right to pleasure. Post Roe v. Wade, sex is an act by which one fundamentally expresses, defines, and enjoys oneself, rather than the ordinary way new human beings enter the world. But the revolution born of these techno-pharmological interventions has been accompanied by a culture-wide cognitive dissonance. And this is particularly true for women. I engage casually in sex, I'm not even sure I want as a kind of right, a right that for women too often becomes a kind of duty, and then am struck pregnant against my will. It is the government then in, in seeking to restrict abortion that would force me to be a mother. When men engage in their putative right to sex after all, they can just enjoy the sex and walk away. And so equality demands from this perspective that women enjoy the right to engage in a life-destroying child-destroying act. 
Put in these stark terms, equality arguments for abortion rights seem rather monstrous. But there is an important insight in this perspective, and it is this. At the heart of sex, there is a deep inequality. But let's get the whole picture of the inequality that is sex out on the table. After all, this sexual inequality, or better, a symmetry, goes deeper still than the basic biological fact that, as Aristotle put it, males reproduce outside of themselves and so can walk away, while females reproduce inside <coughs> of themselves and so cannot. For the sexed hormones that flow through our respective male and female bodies to make such reproduction possible render sex deeply asymmetrical too. For instance, whatever desire for sexual intimacy women may enjoy is invariably unmatched by the testosterone-mediated longing men tend to have for sexual intercourse above all else. For, as Pope Saint John Paul II observed, the curve of arousal in a woman is different from that of a man. It rises more slowly and falls more slowly. Thus, he says, a natural unevenness of physical and psychological rhythms, such that it is naturally difficult for the woman to adapt herself to the man in the sexual relationship. And then, following sex, men are not the ones whose bodies are overwhelmed with oxytocin, the love hormone that attaches a woman to her sexual partner, even if, alas, he is an unworthy cad. <laughs> now, throughout human history, women have attempted all sorts of means and methods to manage and even escape these natural asymmetries, asymmetries that make women vulnerable not only to physically stronger and more libidinous men, but also to the dangers and difficulties of childbearing. From nascent contraceptive methods to dangerous abortions, even to infanticide, desperate women have often resorted to desperate measures. But what is entirely new in this age-old situation, this age-old injustice, is the now widespread view <clears throat> that women's equality, indeed in the late Justice Ginsburg's words, women's equal citizenship, demands the affirmative right to engage in the killing of one's own vulnerable and dependent child. A woman should be equally free to enjoy sexual and reproductive autonomy, that right to have putatively consequence-free sex just like a man, not only so she might be able to escape the vulnerabilities and dangers that pregnancy might pose to her, but as we're increasingly told, so that she might take her equal GDP enhancing place in the marketplace too. <laughs> the chief trouble with this view is not only that it locates women's equality in a kind of imitation of, ma of irresponsible male abandonment, or that it accepts as just violence and domination of the stronger over the weaker, or that it defines citizenship as exclusive of those uh, with caregiving responsibilities and so leaves unchallenged liberal theories in which non-wage earning women and their dependents are relegated to the margins of society, or even that it tends to place the needs and logic of the capitalistic market well ahead of the nurture and care for the dependent and vulnerable. But none of these injustices, as serious as they are, and I hope we'll get to talk to about many of them, gets at the really fundamental trouble with a view of equality that depends upon abortion rights. Such a view, when it takes hold of a culture, eats away slowly perhaps but surely at that culture's capacity to recognize and so authentically respond to the asymmetries at the very heart of the sexual relationship between men and women, though they remain there all the same. The abortion right is a kind of privileged response to these asymmetries, works to paper them over. And so we are surprised and shaken as a culture when 50 years into the 1970s feminist movement, both the Me Too movement and the billion dollar sex trafficking and porn industries reveal just how frequently vicious men still sexually dominate and exploit women well and children too. But this is not how women's equality, indeed women's rights, were first understood. In fact, the history of the cause of women's rights is, or so I argue in my new book, a history of the various cultural, legal, and political responses to what I've been calling sexual or reproductive asymmetry. Champions of joint property ownership and suffrage in the 19th century and workers' rights and basic anti-discrimination law in the 20th, both acknowledged and celebrated embodied sexual differences and the respective responsibilities they entailed. 
But they also argued that these differences ought not disparage women's distinctive contributions nor confine women to maternity alone. Men and women's asymmetrical reproductive powers had historically given rise, after all, to women's legal, political, and social inequality. The earliest women's rights advocates said, no more, but sought not to ignore sexual asymmetry nor reject the consequences of reproduction outright. Rather, they worked to elevate women's dignity, legal status, and contributions in all realms of life, while also demanding far more of men, especially with respect to that virtue that governs men's sexual appetites, chastity. The original vindicator of the rights of women, 18th century British philosopher Mary Wollstonecraft, is most remembered today for her appeal for women's education and entry into the professions. But what might surprise you if you haven't read my book, <laughs> is to learn that Wollstonecraft points to the, quote, want of male chastity as the, quote, grand cause of women's immiseration and, well, a whole bunch of other social ailments, too. In her 1792 treatise, A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, she argues, quote, the little respect paid to chastity in the male world is, I am persuaded, the grand source of many of the physical and moral evils that torment mankind as well as the vices and follies that, that degrade and destroy women. So let me bring you a little bit more deeply into her thought. Wollstonecraft's aim was to set things between the sexes aright. For in doing that, the whole human race, divided as it was between the sexes, might have hope of progressing in virtue and thus finding happiness. Wollstonecraft thus wished to transform intimate relationships between men and women into those governed by mutual respect and affection. In her view, these relationships were too often manipulative and transactional, like a commercial enterprise, or worse, entirely destructive of human dignity. This debasement was of great consequence, and not just for the persons involved. She believed that moral corruption of this most fundamental human relationship sowed corruption throughout the whole of society. And so, in accord with her general view of the passions, Wollstonecraft regarded sexual desire as a natural appetite, but one that needs reason and principle to govern it. As with the other passions, the sexual appetite has certain ends knowable to the intellect, ends that can be respected or thwarted. Its ends are evident in the goods that underlie the sexual act itself. It nourishes intimate affections and encourages procreation. But pleasure, a happy ancillary of the appetites and of the sexual appetites more so than the others, tends to trump purpose, according to Wollstonecraft. And so the sexual appetite can become, quote, depraved, rendering the, the person impulsive and selfish rather than focused on the good of the other, and so benevolent and free. Wollstonecraft believed that true domestic affections, man for woman and woman for man, could channel sexual energies away from the pursuit of pleasure to something that could transform society itself. A man's love for his wife and children could expand his heart and so free him from narrow self-regard. Quote, the tenderness which a, a man will feel for the mother of his children is an excellent substitute for the ardor of unsatisfied passion. Cold would be the heart of a husband were he not rendered unnatural by early debauchery, who did not feel more delight at seeing his child suckled by its mother than the most artful wanton tricks could ever raise. In Wollstonecraft's view, engaged and attentive fatherhood was the very best means to direct men's desires profitably by bringing them into the life of shared domesticity. Indeed, the well-being of women and children too depended for Wollstonecraft upon the capacity of men to take up their responsibilities to both, a responsibility that extends backward to learning to live lives of sexual integrity from their youth. And given men's power and influence in society, such an orientation, thought Wollstonecraft, would yield benefits well beyond the good of his wife and children. Listen to how she contrasts the ill effects of the libertine man with the noble citizenship of the husband and father. From the lax morals and depraved affections of the libertine, what results? A finical man of taste, 
who is only anxious to secure his own private gratifications and to maintain his rank in society. But the character of a husband and a father forms the citizen imperceptibly, producing a sober manliness of thought and orderly behavior. The earliest women's rights advocates in the United States read Wollstonecraft's Rights of Woman and followed her lead. Though efforts to grant women rights to co-equal education, entry into the professions, and eventually the franchise were essential to achieving social and political equality between the sexes, it was here in the sexual and marital relationship between men and women that authentic moral equality and harmonious companionship would ultimately be promoted or forsaken. The 19th century women's movement backed up this view with the now radical belief that male sexual integrity would be even harder to come by where abortion or even contraception made readily available. They, like Wollstonecraft before them, intuited the moral hazard effect that social scientists have described in our time that sex unmoored from its reproductive potential would increase sexual risk-taking, particularly among men, and that the negative effects of what economists now call low-cost sex would redound disproportionately to women, especially among the most vulnerable. The basic insight of 19th century women's rights advocates was not only that abortion unjustly took the life of a vulnerable and dependent unborn child, an act of violence they vocally deplored, Abortion alongside contraception also tilted the sexual playing field further in the male direction, empowering men to prioritize sexual intercourse and their own sexual satisfaction and to ignore the asymmetries of the sexual act. By contrast, they thought that periodic sexual abstinence by mutual decision of the couple or unilateral decision by the woman was the best means to harmonize and equalize the asymmetrical sexual relationships between men and women, meanwhile instilling edifying habits of self-mastery and affectionate regard for the other. Monogamy and deep companionship would be one, it was thought, when men attained a self-governance that freed them from seeking the mere gratification of desires, and when women gained a self-respecting sense of agency, both over, over their bodies but also their own intellectual and moral development too. In light of the stubborn asymmetries in sex, in desire, satisfaction, reproduction, and early caregiving, this voluntary motherhood movement thus expected men to conform themselves to women's sexual needs and desires rather than to their own. The movement was one championed not only by the women's advocates themselves, but by men who joined the noble cause as well. And yet, these insights were abandoned the very next century, just at that point in history when women were gaining the kind of influence in both the private and public spheres that could have made the expectation of male sexual integrity culturally normative. After all, while Wollstonecraft blamed the want of chastity in men and the want of full moral and intellectual development in women, for many social ills, call, calling upon both men and women to virtuously fulfill their respective responsibilities and thus attain personal and societal happiness. Margaret Sanger pointed instead to women's fertile bodies as the chief cause of societal ills, including poverty, famine, even war. Sanger agitated for a technological solution in line with the modern project writ large to the asymmetries in human uh, reproduction. And thus, as I argued at the outset, uh, aggravated and in many ways, uh, 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 you know, made far worse these asymmetries instead. And so here's the crux of the matter and that which is most relevant to our conference theme this year. The older women's rights advocates who followed Wollstonecraft grounded the equality of the sexes and the common human nature women and men share. We are each, regardless of sex, race, or social status, creatures created by and responsible to God, and as such enjoy a kind of native or uh, basic dignity simply by virtue of being human. But she also saw that our shared rational nature 
dignifies us above the brute animals because it is a nature ordered to wisdom and virtue, human excellences that take their bearing in Wollstonecraft's thought from the singular wisdom and goodness of God. As Wollstonecraft put it, humans are meant to, quote, rise in excellence by the exercise of powers implanted for that purpose. But a freedom bereft of virtue, a kind of Hobbesian freedom that leaves men to fulfill their desires above all else, would reduce men to beasts. It's no wonder then that she gave pride of place to the human formation that occurs or ought to occur in the home. For contra Rousseau, Wollstonecraft knew that virtue does not spring forth organically from a child. One must be taught, desires must be schooled, the familial environment and society in which one lives must encourage each person's moral and intellectual development. And so this means that the work of motherhood and fatherhood, of preparing young people, of quote, preparing young people to encounter the evils of life with dignity and to acquire wisdom and virtue by the exercise of their own faculties was for Wollstonecraft and her 19th century successors among the most important work there was. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here, especially as I've greatly enjoyed the books of both my fellow panelists. I think Erica does a beautiful job laying out a profound feminist history that deserves research and reclamation and gives us a good way forward. And without spoiling anything from Abigail's talk, her memoir, which is very funny in addition to being very smart, um, you know, is in some ways the story of a betrayal of that promise, of a feminism that doesn't live up to seeking full dignified equality for women because of the errors it's made. But I'd like to lead off by saying one core truth that mainstream feminism grasps that I find very valuable and a good starting point for engagement with the rest of culture. And that core truth is that women are equal in dignity to men. And we navigate a world that's built with men as the expected default person. And that puts up significant barriers to women's participation as citizens, as friends, as family, in every area of human life. And those, those gaps aren't always motivated by animus. You know, sometimes they're motivated by neglect. Sometimes they're motivated by ignorance. Who's in the room when a tool is being designed and doesn't think about the full spectrum of human experience? You know, I'm sure a number of people in this room, not exclusively women, have just run into the problem you know, that my toddler runs into of just finding the world is the wrong size and shape for you to interact with it. And, this is a little more acceptable for my toddler, though sometimes I feel bad about not having a series of increasingly large chairs for her to sit in comfortably, but she seems very happy to just climb up chairs fully as tall as she is, and then from there, wherever else she can reach. But we kind of have the expectation that for a child, this is a temporary stage. Eventually, a child will grow, you know, if not into full personhood, if we're willing to kind of grandfather them in as persons, even when they're small, they'll grow into a nativeness to the built world and be able to navigate it comfortably. For many women in many domains, that time never comes. It's common to encounter tools, even tools as quotidian as the smartphones I hope people do have on silent in their pockets, <laughs> that are not built with female proportions in mind. Uh, Apple famously refused to make small phones for years as they kept expanding screens and what could be done with them, even as many female users said, I can't hold these phones anymore. You know, they don't fit in my hand. I have to use two hands. Like, well, well, we'll add a functionality where you can make the screen drop so that you can reach it a little bit, but we're not going to make small phones anymore. They're disgusting. <laughs> I'm barely paraphrasing. <laughs> And then, of course, women could not put away the very large phones in the non-existent pockets of our clothing. <laughs> Since, again, when we go to meet the world, the assumption is that the, the way that women meet the world is by presenting attractive lines undisrupted by work or tools, and therefore pockets are mostly irrelevant to what we do in the world. 
These are kind of the funnier examples, but having a world that's not built with women in mind, not built with the full range of humans in mind, you know, isn't just inconvenient, isn't just something to navigate around. It can be dangerous. One of the more notable examples of how dangerous it can be is that women are often at greater risk in car accidents. And the reason is women have shorter legs than men. On average, there are overlapping bell curves. I'm not going to say it every time I discuss differences between women and men, so I invite people to fill in overlapping bell curves when it comes up. And so that means to reach the pedals in a car, women are often positioned closer to the steering wheel than a male driver, which means they're positioned closer to an airbag, which is calibrated for the distance a male driver sits back. So it hits a woman with more force and this results in a higher rate of fatalities, especially because for the most part, cars are tested for safety using dummies with male proportions and weights. And so the particular dangers to women are just not factored in to the actual risk calculations. And when this kind of issue is brought to car manufacturers, uh, there's a quote I want to read you verbatim from one manufacturer, which you know, he understands this is a problem and he really wishes women would take responsibility for being the problem, essentially. <laughs> what he says is, biologically, women are slightly weaker and women sitting closer to the steering wheel can be an issue. There's a difference between men and women, I acknowledge that, and I acknowledge this may be hard for women to accept, but this is not an easy problem to solve. You could say the same thing about the elderly because they are not average either. The aging population is also more vulnerable than average drivers due to weaker bones and muscle mass and tone. And that's his comment. <laughs> Women fall short of being drivers, of being people in some meaningful sense. It's not a problem for him to solve per se. You know, perhaps women and the elderly should consider wearing armor or cushioned <laughs> clothes. He doesn't go into what the solution is. But the problem is, how can he possibly be expected to design cars that work for women? Or the elderly? Or people with limb differences? You know, we kind of get into this question of whenever we start to narrow our definition of who a human is, we find that there are a lot of people left out. Women are one of the largest groups routinely left out, but there's nowhere where women are excluded where people who are elderly, people who are disabled, people who are children aren't also pushed to the margins because it comes from taking a very narrow conception of normal and then asking, sometimes with the best of intentions, how can we help all these strange women people get over being deficient men? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's really the trap feminism sometimes falls into. Sometimes with the best of intentions, because it's hard to figure out how do we rectify a culture that doesn't view women as equal in dignity, as deserving of, I mean, it's funny to say customization because we don't say cars are customized for men, uh, deserving of a range of accommodations to move comfortably through the world. And so a number of people who are active feminists, who I believe, truly believe in the equal dignity of women, make their work around how do I help women counterfeit being men better? so that they can enjoy the freedoms I know they're entitled to. You know, this can be a small thing just for my final car example. Uh, uh, the one author found that she was able to get her car navigation to recognize her voice if she just lowered it dramatically <laughs> because they hadn't tested the AI on female voices and it wasn't prepared to recognize them. This is a small, like, funny the first few times kind of aggravating if it's for the rest of your life accommodation. <laughs> but it's not that different in kind from a lot of the advice given by Sheryl Sandberg in Lean In, which is about how do you navigate a corporate world built around certain male conversational norms, some of which are fine, morally neutral, some of which are actually a little toxic, and say, all right, well, women have to learn to stop apologizing or asking other people's permission to do things. And then if they learn well enough how to do the conversational equivalent of dramatically lowering your voice, then we'll be able to hold jobs and won't that be exciting? We'll be able to tell our cars where to go and then you know go and do our jobs as long as remember not to say, this is just an idea, but, or, oh, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that interfered with your project. You say, no, 
my project trumps your project, and I grind it to the ground under my feet. Uh, and this is, this is more native overlapping bell curves for some women than others. So there are adjustments I find easier to make without being very satisfied with the idea that the way to make space for women in the world of business is to adopt a single way of moving in the world, a single way of interaction, which doesn't work for all men either, but just to find more ways to get more people to fit that narrow mold. Now, of course, contraception and abortion are the most dangerous compromises that women are asked to make in order to make up for not being as good at being men as it would be convenient for others if we were. And that's where I really appreciate you know, the reference to Ruth Bader Ginsburg's argument for abortion. Since Ruth Bader Ginsburg thought, like many people, including many people who are pro-choice, that Roe was decided on kind of flimsy grounds, that it's not primarily a claim about privacy, it's a claim about equal protection under the law. And her claim, as Erica pointed out, was that women cannot have equal protection under the law, cannot be equal as citizens, without having the ability to pay the entrance price to society, which is the ability to abandon someone who's vulnerable and depends on you. I think descriptively she's right. That is the entry price we've put on our society. Abortion is an unjust demand to place on women. It's not the only unjust demand we place on women. Demanding that women go back to work or lose their jobs days or even mere weeks after giving birth to a baby also denies not just the dignity of a child, but just the physical reality of a child. So what I want is to find more ways to invite people who care deeply for the dignity of women, who can see these unjust demands being placed on us time and time again to say, abortion is one more example of that. One more example where we say to a woman, the problem is that you're a woman. It's your responsibility to find a way for us all not to have to deal with that unpleasant reality. And whatever compromise, whatever sacrifice, whatever suffering you have to cause to do that is worth it. Because we don't have room for women here. And when we don't have room for women, we don't have room for babies and vice versa. And that really requires a commitment to acknowledging who women are and who we all are. You know, we just live in a world that makes it a little easier for men to live within the lie that we're all autonomous human beings, which isn't true of men either. And I think every man in the room knows that. It doesn't need me to tell him that. <laughs> but it, our world is a little more ready to accept the particular needs men have or ask them to make unjust compromises of their own but has asked them for so long that they don't feel as unreasonable as they are. I think the recent discussion over Pete Buttigieg's paternity leave, and again, bracket a, a whole other range of comments on that front, there were a lot of efforts to attack him by denying what fathers do, to deny that fathers could have a real demand placed on them, even though they're obviously not nursing a baby, but that there might be a demand of duty that they owe, not just to their wife, but directly to their child, that requires time and space to fulfill. That in fact, the whole point of having a state is to guarantee people the freedom to fulfill their authentic duties. But instead, the way we respond to women's duties is to say that it's a, it's a problem we want to free them from. And what the car manufacturer said is the problem essentially is that women are too vulnerable and too close. And the question is, where are we setting our benchmark for how vulnerable is too vulnerable? And to whom, or in the car's case, to what are we too close? One of the things I found so moving about O. Carter Sneed's recent book, What It Means to Be Human, is it had an articulation of the defense of the dignity of a baby in the womb that was very different than the, the kind of defense I most often see. You know, I usually see defenses of children made by saying, well, the baby is basically like her mother. She's very close. 
We can round up for whatever capacity she lacks. So everything from in Juno, the movie, the moment of your baby has fingernails like you, you're basically the same, you know, which can be a startling realization if you're used to thinking only of clump of cells. So there's a space for pointing out those commonalities. You know, my daughter at this point uh, can perceive light if her eyes are open and she can hear you and me if you guys get rowdy during the talk, <laughs> she'll know. But, you know, she's still a long way from being equivalent in capacity to me. And she also didn't really change in dignity when she acquired the ability to do those things. And what Sneed wrote, which I found so striking, is instead of dignifying the baby by saying the baby is basically like her adult mother, he said, the mother is basically like the baby. It's something we usually, the term we use for that, comparing someone to an infant, is an insult. It's infantilizing. <laughs> because to be dependent on each, on each other is something we consider to be insulting. What Sneed wrote is that the baby has a just demand on her mother and is vulnerable and requires support. And I will tell you that as a pregnant woman, I have a just demand on first my husband and then both of us by virtue of the need created by the vulnerability of my pregnancy on the people around us. Uh, and that just like my baby can rightly kind of demand things of me, not just the continuation of my pregnancy, but you know, things like you have to eat more, you have to lie down now, you're done doing things for the day. I'm like, oh, I, I didn't feel that way. No, you have to do that now. Um, I also have a right then to make demands and that right comes out of my vulnerability and my need. And I'd so rarely seen the pro-life case made that way, starting from weakness, starting from the profound vulnerability of the child and the incapacity of the child and saying, that's basically the same as everyone else. That's why a world that is hostile to women's particular vulnerabilities will always be hostile to others. A feminism that advocates for the dignity of women, for the dignity of women's reproduction is a feminism that is ultimately good for men, good for the elderly, good for children, good for the disabled, because it says we have to meet people as they are. Vulnerability is who we are. And being burdensome to others is who we are. We're not, you know, as we kind of heard in last night's keynote, following the logic of the ADA that everyone is so close to being autonomous, you know, and that the goal is just to lift everyone just a little bit or sometimes a bit more, but the goal is independence. That's, that's not a realistic goal for anyone, disabled or not, pregnant or not, in the womb or not. The question is how we respond to the interdependence we all share and respond to it with love and respond to it with recognition that this is what it means to be a beloved creature of God. Thank you. Well, it's hard to follow both those women, but I'm honored to do so. In both their remarks, they've highlighted some vital feminist concerns, and I'm gonna be honing in on one pressing feminist concern in our cultural moment, that of resecuring the connection between woman and female. When I was in graduate school in gender studies about 15 or 20 years ago, I don't know how old I am anymore, <laughs> we, we, were reading a, um, we were reading an essay by one of those homo French philosophers, I think it was either Levinas or Derrida, I don't know. They all blur together at some point. Um, but in that essay, he was writing as a woman. He was kind of stepping into the discursive space of woman <laughs> and speaking as a woman. And so we were discussing about, you know, whether or not he's allowed to do that. So there were um, mainly only women in my grad program, except for a guy in his 60s named Tom, who decided to do a master's in gender studies after he retired. Um, and <laughs> he was great. He mostly just blushed and giggled <laughs> in our discussions. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if Tom said a word in that seminar, but we all decided, and again, this is a very, very secular, very feminist gender studies program, that no, a man can't just say, okay, I'm a woman. I'm now speaking as a woman. But we're at a very different place now in our culture. We've reached a juncture where appropriating the identity of women is considered laudatory, liberating the next frontier of civil rights. 
and raising cautions or questions about that is blasphemous. Increasingly, defining a woman as an adult human female is considered hate speech. Perhaps you think I'm exaggerating. That probably means you're not on Twitter, which is a good life decision in general. <laughs> but even the most recent HR compliance training I completed for my employer directed me to cease using the phrase pregnant woman and also the word breastfeeding. Such words are now considered discriminatory and banishing them from one's vocabulary is part of the standard package of workplace ethics, along with not grabbing people's bums. <laughs> I want to be clear here, as sort of a disclaimer, that I'm not critiquing individuals who experience gender dysphoria or who don't conform to cultural gender norms. My general position is that we shouldn't medicalize non-conforming people. What I'm critiquing here specifically is the dominant cultural framework that filters and interprets those experiences. So not all trans identified people ascribe to the trans activist slogans and my beef is with the activists. Perhaps the most prominent activist slogan is this, trans women are women. This slogan is now embraced by most mainstream feminist and civil rights organizations like the ACLU who tweets it angrily on a regular basis. I just read angry because it's like all caps. <laughs> but one cannot affirm that statement, trans women are women, without denying that women are female. But if a woman is not an adult human female, then what is she? As it turns out, it's really hard to answer that question. If you don't, if, anyway. here's, a, here's an example from the Australian Academy of Science. A woman is anyone who identifies as a woman. What? <laughs> Here's another one from Catherine Jenkins, who's a British philosopher. A woman is someone who, quote, experiences the norms that are associated with women in her social context as relevant to her. Okay. <laughs> and here's an even longer one from Susan Stryker, a trans-identified person who was writing in Time magazine. Woman is a useful shorthand for the entanglement of femininity and social status regardless of biology. Not as an identity, but as a name for an imagined community that honors the female, enacts the feminine, and exceeds the limitations of a sexist society. I won't take the time here, as, as fun as that would be, to interrogate these definitions and their flaws, although I will say that I'm not exactly sure if I would even qualify as a woman according to these terms. Um, <laughs> Depends on the day, I suppose. <laughs> a feature they share in common, however, is the decisive decoupling of woman from female. But if woman no longer names the millions of humans who are female, by the way, if you have a baby in here, I totally support that, and it's okay if they make noise. <laughs> if, if woman no longer names the billions of humans who are female, how do we speak about them? The tactic du jour seems to be this. Forget persons, let's talk about body parts and functions. A recent Tampax ad exhorts us to celebrate people who bleed. <laughs> well, last I checked, all people bleed. <laughs> so I would suggest to Tampax that next time they be more precise and say, let's celebrate vagina owners who bleed through their vaginas. <laughs> but even mentioning some body parts like breasts is verboten. Instead, we should say chest feeding, because we shouldn't refer to lactating mammary gland havers who do not identify as women as having breasts. I hope you're all writing this down. <laughs> so I'm a bleeder, a chest feeder, and my husband is an inseminator, which sounds like an X-rated comic book hero. <laughs> Captain Inseminator. There are numerous problems with this approach, but I'll just name two. This is dehumanizing in the very literal sense. This approach reduces persons to mammalian parts and functions, like a menu on a porn site or in a butcher's shop. And it elides the glaring reality that these parts tend to come arranged in a bundle. The inseminators are also the testicle havers and the gestators are also the menstruators and lactators. The most stunning aspect of this linguistic insurrection is the unnaming of female humans. To quote Helen Joyce, the quest for the liberation of people with female bodies has arrived at an extraordinary position. They do not even constitute a group that merits a name. 
I'm going to go off script here and say I was about ready to hang up my feminist bowling sho shoes until this stuff started happening. And then I was like, oh, man, really? Like, now we can't even call women women? I'm like, I guess I better put these puppies back on. <laughs> <laughs> so how did we get here? Ironically, feminism. <laughs> For the past five decades, mainstream feminism has enthusiastically been sawing off the branch it is sitting on. While there are myriad iterations and definitions of feminism, a common denominator among them is ostensibly a serious concern with the status and well-being of women. And yet this very concept has been steadily eroded of content by feminists themselves. The evacuation of the word woman is the result of a twofold revolution. First, a conceptual revolution via the concept of gender, and second, a revolution in the material circumstances of women through the embrace of contraception. While she never actually uses the term gender, the seed of contemporary gender theory can be found in Simone de Beauvoir's 1949 book, The Second Sex. One is not born, but rather becomes a woman. This prefigures the turn toward the concept of gender that would begin in the following decade and take hold in the 1970s, largely through the work of psychologist John Money. Money argued that biological sex has no intrinsic connection to men and women's social roles, psychologies, or behaviors. These he saw as products of culture rather than nature, and he imported the term gender from linguistics to refer to them. Money had the unfortunate opportunity to test his theories on a set of twin brothers, one of whom was disfigured by a botched circumcision and then raised as a girl. Throughout these boys' lives, Money published his theories widely, touting his experiment as a success. But it proved to be a catastrophic failure. Both boys, as adults, committed suicide. This tragedy, however, took decades to play out. And in the interim, Money's concept of gender swept through the academy, becoming thoroughly entrenched in feminist theory and the social sciences. This conceptual ascendancy of gender coincides with the normalization and social acceptance of contraception. Both of these upheavals accelerate rapidly in the late 60s and 70s, achieving status quo status by the 1980s. And this sets the scene for the theoretical work of Judith Butler, philosopher whose influence in this realm cannot be underestimated. In the late 80s and 90s, Butler expands the social construction of gender to include sex as well. Female, according to Butler, is as much a social fiction as woman. Through these radical changes in thought and praxis, our procreative potential as sexed beings has receded entirely in our cultural imagination. We no longer think of woman and man, or even male and female, as grounded in procreative potential at all. Why is this bad? Maybe it's awesome. Well, there are a few reasons. One is that the few sex-segregated spaces that continue to exist in Western liberal democracies, bathrooms, locker rooms, prisons, shelters, sports teams, all of those exist for the benefit of women who are more vulnerable to sexual assault and harassment. Mm -hmm. And as Leah so elo eloquently pointed out, just have different bodies. It's baffling, however, to hear radical feminists like Catherine McKinnon, who for decades has held a steady spotlight on women's sexual exploitation, to suddenly poo-poo the idea that women might need separate facilities in certain circumstances. She recently said in a 2015 interview, quote, most bathrooms come with stalls and doors that shut. The only antidote to this collective amnesia is to reassert a definition of woman as an adult human female, the kind of human being whose body is organized according to the potential of generating life within herself. The philosophical category of potentiality includes women who are fertile, because the very definition of infertile signals an innate potential that is prevented from being actualized. If feminism does not correct course and recouple woman with female, it will lose its entire raison d'etre. Because a feminism that rejects a definition of woman grounded in concrete reality, the concrete reality of the sexed body, cannot effectively advocate for those whose lives and circumstances are shaped by that reality. Thank you.
Thank you all so much. We will open it up for questions. There are two mics, one over there, one over here, if you can form a queue. And when you are, I will point to whichever queue I want, and you will please <laughs> say your name uh, by way of introduction and then your question. And if anyone with a baby carrier gets in line, they get to go to the front. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please go ahead. Um, hello, my name is uh, Kelsey Wicks and I'm with Catholic News Agency. Um, I have a question for the panel. I was very surprised to read in the brief for the upcoming Supreme Court case, uh, Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health, that on page 14, there was a footnote which seemed to actually destroy the entire reliance argument for why women need abortions um, uh, because they said in their footnote, Although the term woman is used here and elsewhere, people of all gender identities may also become pregnant and seek abortion care. And, you know, this sort of interesting dynamic that the language seems to be unfolding the, the very argument, essence of the argument for abortion, particularly the legal argument, um, is fascinating to me. I'm wondering if you could speak to that. I, I think this is going to annihilate itself relatively quickly because people notice how much they give up by not being able to claim abortion is a woman's issue. Um, you know, the ACLU recently stripped out all references to women while quoting Ruth Bader Ginsburg on abortion um, because they were bringing her up to date and felt she wouldn't have raised this as a women's issue were she more enlightened and alive. Uh, and I think that really... <laughs> I think that really cuts against the lens through which she saw it, right? Which is the particular burden placed on women by the way we reproduce, by the way we carry a child. Um, and I think ultimately, uh, you know, despite people's attempts to be au courant, they can't sustain that particular framing because it's cut so deeply against the real weight of pregnancy for women. That's very optimistic. I don't know that I'm as optimistic because I don't know about this particular, this particular law, although it's telling that that's in a footnote, right? So a lot of this rewriting is happening in the margins and people don't realize it before it's enshrined in the law. I mean, the, the last piece of legislation I looked at closely was the Equality Act and its definitions, which are really nonsensical. They're a mess. They're a mess for anyone who's trying to think logically, let alone philosophically or even concretely about these terms. Um, but I don't really hear a lot of feminist organizations um, saying anything, like raising much of an objection. Um, so that, and that surprises me, that surprises me. I was like shocked when Catherine McKinnon of all people like jumped ship, like, man, yeah, yeah. So I don't know, but I would love to hear Erica's. Yeah, I mean, I won't get into like a legal analysis. I've written a whole bunch about the stuff on, on this, but I would, so I'm going to say sort of in between, I think there there is this hope in the sense that, you know, happy days when Fonzie jumps the shark. And so this is this, this cultural expression of jump the shark. So it is, there is a way in which the trans issue has made like feminism entirely jump the shark. And so you have these, um, you know, gender critical feminists who are, uh, well, like those of us here, but also in Britain who are really putting a stop to all of this in um, pretty heroic ways like Kathleen Stock and others. And those same women are starting to actually read, well, like people like me or these guys, you know what I mean? And so that's great. So, I mean, I, I when I was writing, um, this book took me a long time because I have seven children. And, um, and it was funny, I kind of was like, well, you know, no one, as we were going, it's like, oh, I'm writing all about men and women and they no longer exist apparently, right? <laughs> and so I keep thinking like, when it all falls down and crumbles down, well, there will be a book that people can look to, <laughs> to remember how it is that we should, you know, uh, defend women's equality and rights and, you know, uh, call men into, into the family, et cetera. So yeah, I mean, I, I personally think just because I'm seeing it, like, in relationships that those women who are, um, you know, are sort of petrified, like real feminists who like, you know, think that the sex body means something and, and those are why the protections and safeguards of anti-discrimination law are there, are starting to read other people's stuff. And so if that's the case, there's a way in which it can bring them all the way. And so pray for that, and I do. Um, and so uh, there's a real importance too in how we, and the three of us are, really into this, I will speak for them, is that 
we have to speak with charity and meet people where they are because they are there to listen. And so I think um, there really is an opening for this. So I am, I'm really hopeful in that way. Thank you. All right, let's go the other side. Thank you very much. Um, on this point about women as being biological females, right? Um, speaking to Abigail's talk particularly, isn't there a certain amount of like self-reflection that we as Catholics should do about this point, right? For every you know secular person who like denigrates stay-at-home parents, don't we all know someone in a Catholic sphere who denigrates working mothers or who's pressured people not to be a working woman? Um, for every kind of you know attempt to remove um, the focus on the body that we see from the issues you're talking about, don't we know situations where people talk about you know the masculine virtues, which seem to include like courage? You know, <laughs> um, isn't there a sense in which? We have spent a lot of time in, in small C Catholic culture, hopefully not big C Catholic culture, but in, in small C Catholic culture, building up scripts and ideas about what a woman is, which is very far away from a biological female and which is imposing a whole bunch of things on women that, that don't need to be imposed. Is it in a sense any surprise that people might say, well, maybe this stuff is the essence of womanhood, so maybe we can strip the biology and just go with the social roles. And don't we have a duty if we want to fight that, not to sort of point that it just as something that's out there, but as to look at, you know, to take the log out of our own eye, I suppose. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And you've asked a question like every day. Are you, are you going for some kind of record? Like who's this Irish guy over here, like hogging the mic? Anyway, no, I think you're exactly right. Um, so there, there are almost like two mirror opposite things happening, right? Where, you know, you've got, like, like for example, once I remember my dad saying to me, because he'll send me articles about this stuff because he knows I write about it. Um, and, and then he'll say, oh, make sure to dress your boys in blue and your girls in pink. And I'm like, mm. you know, like that's, that's the exact opposite of the, of the, it's like the mirror opposite of this problem, right? So if we, if we root what it means to be a woman in the body, it's actually much freer because then what the way you live out your sex, there's so there's capacious room for what that looks like, right? Uh, it doesn't have to follow these, these narrow stereotypes. And in fact, I think the, the latest iteration of what it means to be a woman, when, once you detach it from the body, it has to be defined by stereotypes or just like nothing, just sort of sophist rhetoric, like, oh, it's magic and imagination and blah, you know, that doesn't make any sense. But often what it looks like is a very stereotypical iteration of what it means to be a woman. So I do think that rooting, rooting the identity in the body is actually, is actually the way to go beyond these polarized stereotypes. I half agree with you, um, in part because I think there's a real freedom in just saying people are men and women, and then they can worry less about whether you know, they've gone through the intense period of self-consideration to choose. Um, I, I wouldn't have wanted the kind of help I might have gotten if I were growing up today of, well, you wear baggy clothes and you're really aggressive as a personality and speaker, um, you know, and you're the captain of the mathletes team, you're the only girl on this entire bus of mathletes going to the state competition. Like, is it possible you aren't a girl? Like, and, and I think people say that genuinely trying to be helpful, but it's, it's making womanhood very narrow to say, you're kind of at the edge of what I expect, you know, even for things as moderate as like, you like physical activity and having a body, you know, which is something women are allowed to do. Maybe, maybe you'd feel freer if you just didn't have to be a woman while you did it. But I, I don't think that's quite it. Um, and I think the, the limitation of kind of, as Catholics turning just to the biology is that we care about biology because it's an expression of God's love for us. Um, and that if I just make a biological argument, even though there are some avenues I can open that way, I'm really not telling the truth about why I care. Um, and it doesn't always work for me to take a hard pivot from, well, you know, what are men and women? Let's start with chromosomes or parts of it, just to like, what are men and women? Well, women best image the church and men best image Christ, uh, which, which is not where I start always with secular friends, but it's, it's there and it's part of what I'm thinking. Um, and it's what gives meaning to the biology for me, that sense of women's capacity for reproduction being a receptive capacity, um, you know, receptive to a beginning initiated in a different way looking at the wide range of female saints 
And seeing that even if I look at a male saint who's a soldier and Saint Joan of Arc, their same heroic virtues of courage are expressed differently and received differently whenever and around them knows they come from a man or a woman. So I often make a kind of pointillist argument about gender, starting with the saints, because I know they're good expressions of what it means to be a man or a woman well. And we see how wide that range of examples is. Yeah, let me just really quickly, um, well, I don't know, if I start talking about Rousseau and Wollstonecraft, it's probably not going to be a good answer. Um, but I just, again, like when I was writing my book, I thought I was writing for the left, like people I've engaged in the pro-choice movement. And I actually, turns out I'm writing for the right. I had no idea. So I have encountered, and we actually, just in the past issue of First Things, there's kind of a call for like a, a renewed patriarchy. I've heard of women, in fact, people I know calling for coveture again. Um, and yeah, the, there are recent um, uh, big talk on masculine virtues. And this is again why I think Wollstonecraft's so good is because she was dealing with Rousseau who wrote in the Emile all about masculine virtues of you know, active and reason, et cetera, and feminine virtues of kind of submission. And it, it's really, to me, that's just like falling back into Rousseau. But Wollstonecraft points out that there's a logic in virtue because it's always participation in God, right? And so God is a unitary. And so there isn't kind of masculine and feminine virtue. There's virtue, but there are distinctive duties based on our different bodies and our different, um, you know, relations, et cetera. And so as she would say, um, you know, we answer our distinctive kind of duties with the same human virtue. And I just think that's a beautiful way of putting it and kind of getting at this problem we have right now. Rousseau also so wrote an entire book on education of children and abandoned every single one right. of his children. And I think he should never be mentioned in the context of philosophy without both those facts being no. mentioned in parallel. <laughs> Hello, thank you very much. My name is Carlos, I'm from Honduras. I have a, no, a social initiative with my sister um, called uh, Invisible Woman. It, as a summary, it's a workshop that we use creative writing and paint art to help uh, low income single mothers to overcome their past, embrace their present, so they can dream for a better future for themselves and their, their children. So one thing that I, I, I was amazed when, when I find it out that um, when these women are remembering their past um, because, and they have like um, emotional injuries. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I, I found out that the, they have the fault of that responsibility of the man that um, ran away home. And I was like amazed what, what, what they have like, what are the reasons you can give me some insights? What are the reasons that they think like that way? Because what I can tell you is 85 maybe percent of the women that we are serving, um, they consider that it's their fault of why men go away and the, their fault of her situation. Yeah, yeah I mean, I... Um one of the things I also, I mean, one of the things Wollstonecraft was dealing with was just that virtue for women, well, you all know, like feminine virtue is just chastity. It's just purity. And so she was saying like women should be called to all of the virtues and men actually should be called to chastity because there's always been a kind of prevailing sexual double standard. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, this is, um, you know, in, in practice, why do women take this on? I mean, I think that there's like a cultural thing there. I mean, we even have it, if we're gonna criticize the pro-life movement a little bit, I'll just add my two cents. Um, <laughs> that there's a way in which we tend to talk about, and I'm fully on board with, um, helping women, helping mm. pregnant women, hel helping women in crisis. Absolutely, yes, but where's the father? You know, I mean, there's another person who, well, there's a person who impregnated the woman, frankly, right? And so there's a way in which we have to like knit this back together um, and, um, you know, I, I think that there's something cultural that, that makes a woman think it's entirely her fault well, um, and, and leaves the, the man out instead of realizing, like, we need to have, um, you know, there has to be sort of a, there used to be, you know, sort of a moral um, opprobrium for men who abandoned children, right? And so that we've we got to bring that back, frankly. I mean, that's just a basic thing that people need to be called to fatherhood. And... And I think it's a real mix of kind of moral opprobrium and real, that, that, that can be framed as like, well, we've got to go like find all the men with sticks and beat them up till they act like men again. Um, and I'm not saying that's not a reasonable place sometimes to start. <laughs> but that kind of 
plays into what's already that bad idea that for a man to be a father is bad for him, right? Something he'll have to be brought to by force, not a real gift that he's turned his back on and may miss. Um, and I think one thing, my, my favorite moment of the 2020 political presidential campaign, and I had very few of them, right? Um, <laughs> Well, was the real moment of fatherly love showed by Kanye West at one of his otherwise very confusing political rallies. <laughs> but, but he talked about the fact that he'd come close with his wife to choosing abortion during one of their pregnancies. And he started crying, you know, at the event. And I think we don't make very much room for men's grief in not being fathers in choosing to walk away from fatherhood and not being sure how to return. Um, and that we shouldn't think of, you know, the support we provide as just a, you know, a cudgeling towards virtue. We all believe virtue is good for people. You know, inviting men into their full role as fathers, inviting them into responsibility, inviting them to be burdened uh, is not ultimately bad for them and not something we ultimately hope to do by force. It's something we think lets men live their fullest lives in Christ. Um, and we're not trying to do this to them, right? We're doing it for them because there's, there's not just a burden that's missed, there's a real gift that's missed in the burden. Hi, Hadar Khazani, first year PhD here at uh, Notre Dame, uh, political theory. Um, I, I'm, uh, thank you for just a series of great talks. Um, I'm very sympathetic to uh, a retreat uh, uh, fortification of the concept of woman as a biological entity, biological category. Um, and maybe it's really necessary today politically to, to win some arguments. But I'm also afraid of such a retreat. And I think, I said, tell me what if you think this is correct, but that there is a risk that if we state that a woman is a female, we are going to give up on everything else that could possibly make a woman a woman. So possibly, for example, clearly females give birth, but people who give birth don't necessarily have to raise children. The children could be raised, you know, as Plato uh, uh, suggested, by a commune or by men or by animals for all we know. We can throw them in the wild. So oh, I'm not an expert on women, but on, uh, on men. <laughs> You know, a man certainly is, quote unquote, an inseminator, biologically speaking, but he is not a father, biologically speaking. Biologically, he can get up and leave and never return. And if we're insisting on saying, no, this is very dangerous saying that, that gender is not biological, are we not risking also failing to educate our children in the moral virtues which come with gender? That's an open-ended question. I don't have an answer. So I, I never said that I want to define women biologically. I think woman is a personal category. I think women should be defined as persons, and persons include the body, but are not reduced to the body. So that's one distinction I would make. So anytime I talk about the body, you should hear that sacramental and spiritual dimension as well, you know, because I'm always saying the body in a Catholic sense. So it includes the biological, but cannot be reduced to the biological. So I would, I would just make that important distinction. But I think, by and large, feminism has had such an allergy to biological essentialism that ha it has really tried, even in you know, some of the, the scenarios you described, to completely eradicate that dimension or to free women as much as they can from those, maybe by outsourcing, child rearing. And, but then we get back to the question about, well, what, <laughs> What is good for human beings? What do human beings need? Is there a natural um, bond between parents and a child that when possible should be nurtured and, and all of these sorts of questions? So, but the most important thing I would say is that I, I am definitely not making a reductivist point here, reducing women to biology um, because women are, are persons, um, body and soul. Thanks. Oh, um, so I've got it. So I liked the point that you, the points that um, you were making about um, 
kind of it being a mistake to see um, kind of the male body as the normal body um, and it being a mistake to, um, I guess, pursue equality for women by trying to make them more like men. Um, but I have a question about, um, I guess, firstly, if you see feminists who you think are doing that and you think it's somewhat misguided, and then secondly, if you just think, well, I should be doing an alternative thing, then that's better than that. Um, I guess I was just wondering kind of what do you think are some kind of ways in which people could promote women as women, not as women trying to be men, and also some ways in which you could constructively respond to feminists who are trying to do something similar to you, but not exactly what you want to do. Um, I think a lot of the room for engagement is that everyone knows this is a bad idea. Um, and unfair to women. And the question is really about whether they think other options are on the table. Um, and for some of the kind of the more totalizing demands placed on women, particularly around fertility, there's just very little hope that other options are on the table. You know, folks who identify as pro-choice often are willing to talk about the fact that many women who seek abortion don't see themselves as choosing between several options they could pick. Uh, women will talk frankly who are advocates for abortion access that this is the only option on the table. And if we take that away, people will just fall into poverty, you know, be at risk of their lives. But that, you know, they, they agree with me that we don't have a world that's hospitable to women or hospitable to children. And part of the question is engendering a sense of hope that better is possible um, and looking for good examples to hold up of people doing that work well. And one place where I see a particular opportunity for solidarity is with the disability movement, because that's about not accepting a very narrow view of the human body to dominate our built environment and our social environment. Uh, I have a forthcoming review in Plow Magazine of two excellent books, uh, What Can a Body Do? and Making Disability Modern, that are both about how we design the built world and what kinds of bodies are accommodated or excluded. And one of the things that's remarkable is that there are a lot of ways we do make space for a range of bodies that we don't remark on because once we get used to them, we don't think of it as making space for different kinds of bodies. They just enter what we accept. Um, there's a whole essay that I love that was just about in early colonial America, because walking sticks were fashionable, it didn't mark you out as different to use a cane to support your weight as opposed to be a dandy. <laughs> and I think a lot of the challenge for women and for everyone who doesn't fit a very narrow range of the body is what accommodations are reasonable and how do we make space for them as normal? You know, the successor to the colonial cane is actually a rolly suitcase that was built by a Japanese man who had physical disabilities. That's really a decoy rolling suitcase. Um, the idea is it's normal to bring a suitcase into public spaces. You might be going somewhere, you might be important, and you can support your weight without looking like you have to. And even there, that's only a partial victory. That's almost an analogy to the how can you pretend to be a man more convincingly? How can you pretend not to need accommodations? So it's, again, that tension that I think is a fruitful one to work on. Where can we make progress um, between I want people to be able to move through the world and perhaps by being able to move through them and encountering others, make more space for themselves as they are, versus I don't want people to have to use a fake bag to feel all right in the world. And the, the feedback he got is, could you make the wheels quieter? I don't want anyone to notice it, right? And I think that's often the challenge women face, you know, just the same way we have a way to move the world. I hope no one notices I'm doing it because I don't trust that if people notice I'm here, that they'll respect me. Let me just add one sentence on that. Just in terms of workplace accommodations, I think there's a very, um, I mean, it's sort of obvious to probably anyone here as Catholics, we sort of understand this, that if we make workplace accommodations for pregnant and um, caregiving mothers mm -hmm. generally, then that also opens up the possibility of fathers, many of whom they're more and more stay-at-home fathers or just fathers who want to spend more time with their children. It also opens up in terms of like flex work and flexible, you know, technology, um, working from home, et cetera, opens up the ability for women, for people to do all sorts of other things. And so not really like beholden to the market as kind of their family or something, you know, where they owe their, their, their biggest duties. And so then allows for the family to be really the, the really priority of culture. And I think that just shifts kind of, the whole sort of marketplace mentality that tends to be really bad for the family.
right. I think we have time for one last question. I realize we're kind of at time. We have a five o'clock closing mass, but let's take one more question from you over Hi, uh, Felix Miller at Catholic University. Um, I'm, I was really moved, Leah, uh, by your uh, articulation of uh, Carter Sneed's sort of reversal mm -hmm. um, with the child's dependence and the mother's dependence. Um, and I guess I'm wondering how to articulate interdependence in a secular world, um, just because it, it it seems sort of, as a cradle Catholic, it's sort of interdependence very like, just definitionally the case. Um, and, and I find often talking with secular friends, um, that there is very, almost sort of deeply felt this shame at having a kind of, having needs for others and this this real sense that we ought to be these autonomous beings. So, so I guess I'm, I'm sort of curious on how you think we ought to try to articulate this. I'll give you briefly a theory answer and a practice answer. So you can, you know, take them respectively to your theory and practice friends. Uh, if you want a secular articulation of this, there's actually very moving ones in David Graeber's enormous book, Debt, The First Thousand Years. Um, and I will mention a selection from it because it is an enormous book. Um, but he cites a fellow anthropologist who lives among uh, the Tiv people in Nigeria and has to kind of learn about the ways they give gifts to each other. And the trick of it is that it takes her a little while to get is that you always return a gift, but you don't return it exactly. You don't pay people back exactly. Because that indicates a desire to be quits. That's the, that's the colloquial term for it. When you have a position of complete equality, you're done. And you're free, as Erica has been talking about, to walk away. And it's that sloshing of debt of, you know, I picked up dinner for you last time. And then when I was sick, you brought something over for me to read. And it never quite balances, we, we might lose track of which of us owes something to each other, but we know that there's this kind of unfinished business that can only be answered by more service that makes a relationship. And anything else is a purchase. So that's the theory answer. For lived practice, my advice to everyone here is to get one step more open about your own needs and dependencies, including ones that you could do yourself but would appreciate someone else helping you with. Uh, as a witness to your friends that it isn't disgusting to need things from people because it takes real practice to see that. And when you share your own needs with someone else, you may be surprised by what bigger need they share back with you once you've given them a clear signal that you don't think it's disgusting. You don't think it's a threat to your friendship to say, I'm not feeling well, would you come over and make me dinner? Like, <laughs> Raise your hand if you'd feel totally comfortable asking a good friend that right now. Not that many of you, it's not an unreasonable request for a friend, right? So take, take that first step into vulnerability, have a nice dinner your friend makes you when you feel sick, uh, but give a witness that it isn't disgusting to need things. Thank you all so much. Let's thank our panel.